Thank you for listening to this forum podcast. Please check out our website for a rich archive of podcasts and writing from contemporary philosophers and other researchers on a wide variety of topics. The Forum is an educational charity dedicated to bringing academic philosophy to a broader audience. Please consider donating to us via our Just Giving page, which you can find on our website. Happy listening. So, welcome to the Forum. I'm Shahida Bari. You can call me Shahida. I'm your chair and one of the fellows of the Forum. So, uh, the Periscope development is a very exciting one. I also just spilled lots of water on the mics and there was nearly an electrocution <laughs> accident, so that would have also been an interesting development. Um, uh, this event is called Digital Selves. If you think you're in the wrong room, then raise your hand because we will zap you like a glitch in the matrix. <laughs> Control, alt, delete. Not really. No file erasing here tonight. Only endless internet exploring instead. In fact, this event is being live streamed, so an additional hello to those of you following from home. Now, this event gathers together a panel of writers, thinkers, and activists to examine whether or how the conception of selfhood, as it has been conceived and articulated in the work of philosophy, whether that notion of selfhood has been transformed, repurposed, damaged, or is entirely unaffected by the digital age and the technology with which we conduct daily life. There are a couple of ways into this. Um, I think one is to ask how far our old-fashioned models of cognition, perception, and emotion have been challenged by technology or not. Another is to assess how far we can harness technology for the rearticulation of selfhood, or indeed to ask whether we think it's been injurious to ideas of selfhood. You can pose your own questions shortly when we open up to the floor, but in the meantime, I want to introduce our panellists and get them to set out their thoughts for you. So our panellists tonight are David Berry. He's a professor of digital humanities and social and political thought at the University of Sussex. He's published widely on the subject of critical theory and philosophy and the digital, and has a forthcoming book, is this right, called Philosophy After Computation. Indeed. Great, that sounds relevant, right? Um, Lawrence Scott is an author, academic and broadcaster. He's the writer of The Four-Dimensional Human, which was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize uh, two years ago, I think. Um, and that book investigated a kind of poetics of digital life. And his new book, Picnic, Comma, Lightning, is due out uh, next year. And Legacy Russell is an artist and writer of essays, fiction, poetry, and cultural criticism. She has an MRes in visual culture from Goldsmiths College. Her academic and creative work focuses on gender, performance, digital selfdom, idolatry, and media ritual. She's going to talk about Glitch Feminism, which is the title of her forthcoming book next year, I think, Verso. It's your first book. Lovely. Okay, so David's going to start. David, this is a philosophy forum primarily, and you trained as a philosopher. You also teach critical theory. You've written about Nietzsche. Are we undergoing something new under the sun, and do philosophers need to overhaul the account of the self they've provided so far as a result of this digital age? So first I'd say thanks for the invitation. It's very nice to come and speak to you all, uh, even though it is a little bit warm in the room. I hope uh, we can all cope. Um, so to um, reflect a little bit on this notion of, of the self, um, first and foremost, I suppose uh, we should uh, uh, consider that, you know, really, philosophically, we haven't really reached a kind of end point in the conversation in philosophy. There's no um, account of the self that has become um, uh, all, all defining and, and conflicting ideas and multiple uh, theorizations around the self uh, continue to be articulated. But I do think that um, you know, it's interesting the way in which digital technology is causing us to rethink some of the categories, to rethink uh, certain ways of understanding about ourselves, and also challenges us to think about alternative ways of being and alternative ways of thinking as well. Um, certainly, I do think that philosophy continues to call on us to think. Right? I think that's a fundamental issue. And we might want to think about the extent to which digital technologies uh, really undermine the capacity to think. I think that's the first uh, uh, contribution, really. The second thing to think about, really, is also, um, you know, what is a life worth living? Is a, a classic philosophical question. And in the relation to some of the uh, interventions of digital technologies in our lives and the way in which they shape and structure our lives, we might want to consider, you know, how the the worthiness of a life and the capacity for worthiness is itself 
problematised through these technologies. So what I want to do, I mean, um, I haven't got much time to be able to, to give a, a presentation, but I do want to just pull out a couple of um, important uh, sites of investigation, perhaps, for us to think about these issues. So first we might uh, reflect on the fact that, in a general sense, we might say the self is not given. Right? The self is in some sense constructed and is configured and it in some way is um, uh, produced through a period of um, uh, uh, essentially education, right? an intensification around notions of learning, socialisation or what we might call individuation. So if we think about the self as something that has to be formed, that something isn't in a, in a, um, isn't uh, presented to the world uh, or thrown into the world unproblematically, as it were, uh, we might think about, for example, uh, the Kantian distinction between minority and majority, right? That there is, we, we continue to have this, this notion that there is a difference between, for example, childhood and adulthood, and that the, uh, the condition of minority, as it were, is in some sense a condition that requires certain faculties to be strengthened. Uh, those uh, faculties have already been referred to, for example, cognition, attention, and so on and so forth. And moving towards uh, a condition of um, what, of course, can consider to be enlightenment is a condition of autonomy, right? This condition of autonomy is the ability to think for oneself, the ability to have a sense of oneself and to have an account of one's life purpose, as it were, a projective sense, if you like. And this is in contrast to a notion of heteronomy, whereby one is uh, essentially in a world of sensation, in a world of chaos, and is unable to make sense of this world, and easily open to manipulation, easily distracted, and doesn't really have the faculty of attention fully developed. So here is perhaps the first site at which we might want to think about the way in which digital technologies may actually be creating a new kind of situation, uh, or, or perhaps revealing... Um, uh, previously hidden ones, right? So the um, uh, technologies definitely um, problematise these notions of minority and majority. They create a kind of derangement of knowledge, if you like. And in terms of, for example, the way in which we think about education, the structures of education, and even the, the capacities that are required for entering majority, uh, these are uh, really up in the air, as it were, right? So uh, let's just think about attention as, uh, as one, one uh, capacity. Um, Silicon Valley, the programming industries, uh, uh, the companies, the gaffers, the fang, whatever uh, you want to call them, they have a political economy uh, around, uh, essentially, um, advertising. And so for these companies, it's, they, they are not really interested in the autonomy of the self. Right? The autonomy of the self is in some sense problematic. And so they seek to kind of undermine these uh, structural faculties of the self and in doing so produce uh, a world of distraction. And we know this from our everyday experience of, of the world, uh, the way in which um, this constant um, sea of notifications, of distractions, of, of, um, especially with the mobile technologies that we uh, carry around with us. Now, on, on the one hand, we get this this kind of issue. On the other, we have the notion, really, that you know we we invest a lot of time and money in our education, in our, it, as it were, production of majority socially, right? And so uh, there is a conversation um, going on in society. I think it is a, a continual conversation, but I think interestingly um, affected by and to some extent determined by these silicon companies that want to be active in these kind of educated processes. So we, there's a lot of questions to ask about that, and I think a lot of questions about the way in which we set up our understanding of self uh, in relation to this. Um, next, we might want to think about um, the way in which uh, digital technologies problematise our sense of self in as much as we are, right? So I'm thinking here particularly of the notion of... Um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, and, and, and capacities like uh, distant learning, algorithmic means of dealing with big data, with uh, large corpus, uh, and so on and so forth. And what we find here is a kind of a confrontation, or the possibility of a confrontation, between different ways of thinking and different ways of structuring knowledge, actually. Uh, and these, I think, also problematise what we may have previously considered to be exemplary 
exemplary notions of the self, right? <laughs> what was it that, that what requirements, what capacities uh, were required to be fully active as a self in the world, or certainly within uh, the Western tradition and the Western societies? So, uh, for example, these different ways of thinking uh, raise questions about how we think, right? Uh, they raise questions about what it is to think. And it, they raise questions about what it is um, to, to train uh, to, to understand and think. Um, so, um, uh, you know, this uh, really connects, I think, to a very concrete uh, issue that, for example, Google has openly expressed that it wants to essentially own a third of your brain, right? And owning a third of I your... I don't know I've got a third to spare. <laughs> yeah. Moment, but yeah. I'm not sure anybody has. But I think there's something very interesting about this notion of, of uh, uh, having full control of a third of your brain. And, of course, it's interesting the use of the word brain rather than mind. I think there's a whole mm -hmm. interesting discussion uh, to be raised around that. How much more time do I have? About three minutes. Three minutes, okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, lastly, lastly, I might, uh, might just raise the question of um, how these digital technologies affect our sense of self and our, our understanding of ourselves in relation to a kind of derangement of meaning. So these, these technologies um, problem, problematise, um, in a sense, um, uh, certain kinds of narrative structures or certain kinds of assumptions that we have historically about the way in which knowledge is constructed. And here I'm thinking, for example, about the database form uh, or, or the way in which collections are put together in, in computer systems. And essentially, computers can uh, very easily manage with very contradictory information, very large quantities of information, and uh, are able to pass and, and process these in a way in which it's very difficult for us to deal with. Now, of course, this means that our... our, uh, our uh, requirement for meaning is in some sense undermined, right? Mm -hmm. But not only is that, that requirement for meaning undermined, i.e. we cannot make sense of these technologies, which of course are, these, are technologies of recording and technologies of um, legibility, as it were, they also undermine our sense of what it is to be a self in as much as one narrates our identity. So, for example, um, we increasingly see a stream-like technologies that reconfigure us, not as, say, um, thinking about ourselves as an artwork or as a novel or, or whatever metaphor you used to use, but actually in terms of like a Twitter feed or a Facebook feed. And that actually life is a constant stream of information. Uh, each parcel of information does not necessarily have to refer to another part. And this essentially creates a kind of fracturing of the self and undermines this unitary sense of self and a sense of life uh, trajectory. Thank you. I'll leave it there. I'll leave it there. Um, I want to ask you about distraction and attention, which were two terms that came up. I, I'll note in passing that I was really distracted by your Apple Watch in the middle of the talk. Is that an Apple Watch? So there's a question about how far your own thinking is distracted <laughs> by technology, which you might answer. But um, as you were talking about distraction, I was thinking... Um, not of the future, but I was thinking of Walter Benjamin, right? Walter Benjamin writing in the essay about aura in the age of mechanical reproduction where he says distraction is a kind of um, a riposte to the tyranny of attention. Attention is a kind of totalitarianism and distraction is democratic and fa fracturing, actually. And fracturing is one of the terms you use. So there's something... In the, kind of, in the old philosophers, there is a kind of redemption of that distraction technique too, right? Sure. So, um, firstly, we have to think about, I mean, the, the notion of distraction, the notion of attention themselves are historical terms. Mm. Um, and, in fact, attention is not a very old notion. It only dates back to uh, around the 1880s, 1890s, mm. uh, particularly, particularly um, um, William James. Yep. Uh, and um, why the notion of attention was uh, constructed in, in uh, uh, a certain sense was because previous notions about how one is able to focus, which were built around um, uh, kind of notions of association, etc., were actually very difficult to quantify. So attention is a quantifiable notion, and certainly in terms of the growth of psychology uh, 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 and so on and so forth, it's become a, a very much... Um, a, a, a notion that we uh, use as a, 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 an everyday term, but actually has quite an interesting uh, genealogy. So w we could say that the notion of um, attention and distraction that Benjamin is, is deploying is, is different to what we might think of as attention and distraction today. I think that's one thing we should consider. The other thing is that um, 
for Benjamin, there was something revolutionary about certain kinds of media technologies that reconfigured the way the world was. And of course, he thought that film, right, with its um, possibility of, I, I would say, new kinds of narrative, offered uh, revolutionary possibilities, right? And of course, I, I think that's true of digital technologies. So if I've uh, given a very dark picture of the digital technology, that certainly wasn't my intention. It's just merely the limitations of time. I'm just um, thinking on you. Yeah, OK. But, uh, so, so I think those possibilities that Benjamin points to in, in his thinking, I think, are there in digital technologies as well. I think it, there is a question about how one uh, deals with those technologies, what the contours and the... Uh, um, the frameworks around them are. What do we want from these technologies? How far do we want them uh, to to uh, affect us and our, our sense of self, as it were? Um, but um, yeah, so I would, you know, in a certain sense, I'd like to have my cake and eat it, really, and say that no, distraction is it's certainly an interesting and revolutionary concept, but not in terms of the distraction that's um, deployed by these Silicon Valley companies. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have in mind the revolutionary <laughs> possibilities that Benjamin yeah. responded well, to. Well, <laughs> let me, okay, let me, I, I can totally take that point. I'm going to ask you one more follow-up question and before I invite Lawrence and Legacy to respond to you. But just in that moment when you talked about the difficulty and following on from your, um, your suspicions about these companies, Silicon mm. Valley companies, um, that moment when you talked about not being able to make sense of these technologies, and I wondered, this is kind of put on your tin hat moment, <laughs> whether not being able to make sense of these technologies is deliberate mm -hmm. and mystifying that we can't make sense of them, mm -hmm. but we still need to use them. And it's important that we can't, we don't know how the algorithm works, that we're absolutely dependent mm -hmm. on them. We can't scrutinize them. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot going on there, really. And, uh, you know, uh, you know the, uh, to some extent, I think you're right. I think that there is uh, a deployment of technologies that deliberately don't make sense. Now, here I'm going to show my age uh, <laughs> because I find the Snapchat interface completely mystifying. Right? I, I think that is there are a lot of people not terrible. Their no, no, I'm sure there aren't. I think if you're under 30 or something, it makes a lot of sense. But the Snapchat interface is quite interesting because it is a deliberately mystifying interface. I think it's an interface built around. Um, sensation perhaps or built around a certain kind of set of practices that don't necessarily make sense and that's kind of interesting but I think more more widely in terms of technologies um, one of the problems we've got is really the, the, the sheer scale right the sheer scale of these technologies and the interconnectedness and really the kind of bizarreness that the bizarre kind of structures they build when they are put together so you know, who would have thought that, um, you know, um, mining these kind of um, hyper-personalised uh, data points, uh, uh, as is done by Cambridge Analytica, which constructs certain notions of the self algorithmically, which then can be targeted in really quite aggressive and unpleasant ways, but actually have profound effects on, for example, the American election and, of course, the referendum on uh, our entry into the European, uh, uh, staying in the European uh, Union. So... Our ability to make sense is, I think, a kind of key one for us to think about. It's a, it's a key problematic. And we must, must make sure that we don't uh, lose sight of how important that is and how we um, uh, deploy uh, notions of meaning around these technologies. Thank you. We're going to talk about algorithms next year in an event scheduled for the spring. Um, Lawrence, can you help David with Snapchat, or do you have another question for him? I have another question, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> I'm, I'm well over the Snapchat legibility age <laughs> that, he, that David set out. Um, I really love to actually this idea of legibility because um, uh, it seems to me that our online digital presence is encouraged as much as it can be by these Silicon Valley companies to be completely legible while, while the backstage algorithms are not. But, and there was one really amusing sort of uh, moment of irony a couple of years ago. I noticed that um, a robots AI lab um, opened up um, a, a robot onto the market and it could, it could read sort of 67 different facial features of a human. And yet we were given in the same few months six new reactions by Facebook on which to respond. And I thought that was a real sort of comedy of errors of our times, that it is really beholden, uh, or we're, we're sort of coaxed all the time into simplifying our responses in order to achieve this legibility, which isn't really our own for our own benefit, it's so that we can be recognized. Um, does that sort of ring true, the sense of, you're talking about the Twitter feed self. Is legibility high up on the new um, 
sort of citizen demands of citizenry that we be legible mm. so that we can be read online of course i mean uh, in terms of the kind of uh, science of networks and the requirements for computational analysis one has to be in the system one has mm. to put data in and another way of uh, position this actually is that these systems have to capture right they yeah have to perform and they have to capture yeah so data is constantly captured even when we may not think data is being captured it's constantly being captured around us and this is really important for these companies because for them to and they are you know building models of the world they're trying they are kind of creating new kinds of what they call social physics right they're trying to create maps they're trying to create systems and structures to understand what it is we do and why we do it because of course they want to sell us things mm -hmm. and and really uh, create this kind of uh, consumer uh, model that allows them to make uh, uh, huge amounts of cash but in relation to this uh, in relation to this question of legibility and why it is that there's such a simplification i think there's a couple of reasons for that i think one of them is that um, even in the um, the world we're living now, computational power is still finite, right? Mm -hmm. And so the, all of these companies suffer from too much data, actually, and they have huge problems dealing with the data they've got now. Mm -hmm. um, and so simplification of our data input helps them, right? So if we can learn to articulate ourselves in, a, in eight emotions mm -hmm. or eight facial structures or whatever mm -hmm. that helps them to process it right mm -hmm. and certainly as the processing cost comes down as the storage costs come down i'm sure that they will open up uh, this yeah. structure the second thing th to think about is that they like to articulate uh, these kinds of interface in terms of grammars and one of the things these companies are doing is they're teaching us to be computational mm -hmm. in a certain mm -hmm. sense you could say they're teaching us to have a kind of computational way of being to mm -hmm. articulate ourselves through computational forms and these kinds of grammars are about really uh, speaking into the computer in a way in which we create packets of data packets of information about ourselves uh, and this ag again allows for processing storage and so on and so forth so i think you're you're absolutely on, uh, right on the question you're asking in, in terms of legibility and why this simplification process is taking place can i Leg legacy i'm inviting you to i feel like you might know some of that grammar I do, and I also have to say, I also dislike Snapchat, but I have to say that um, I think that there are sort of two things that are standing out for me here. The first is perhaps to suss out the strands that the labor that is kind of unpaid that we're putting into these systems, for me, is one of the greatest problematics. As users. As users, right? And so when we're kind of talking about the production of material, right, and how it performs and how data operates within that, I think that for me, that's the thing that is always um, pissing me off, okay? <laughs> right? <laughs> the then if you're on the other side of it, I think that what we're talking about here is needs to be called out and named that we are currently at the London School of Economics. We're in London, which is one of the most expensive cities in the world, okay? Majority of the people who are in here, we are privileged to be in this space. So for us to be sitting here in any capacity and talking about the production of knowledge and how we as individuals in this room um, might want to weigh in on the quality and content of, I think is it, it requires some deeper thought. So from my perspective, um, I think that we're assuming a lot about the publics that engage with these technologies. Um, and when we're talking about this idea of simplification and um, you know, this, this notion of distraction or um, the word, the kind of the, the idea of the derangement of meaning, I, I find that to be particularly problematic within a scope of talking about a wider arc of knowledge kind of because exactly and, yeah. because many people don't have access to what we have here in this room right now so if we use this as a micro study of what kind of extends beyond um, this the idea that for example people were being turned away at the door they're going to have to go online to watch this happen mm -hmm on the internet, right? So um, I think that it's incredibly um, imperative for us to be calling that out and to be talking about the idea that the production of knowledge um, within this idea of like, the canon or the kind of academy that we're sitting in is very rarefied. Um, so asking people to kind of step into that with us um, is, I, I think, questionable. We should be looking outside of it. That's a useful intervention, and I will let David kind of um, reply to that but later. <laughs> um, I want to move to Lawrence, first of all, um, so, because I want to ask you a lit question, because your last book was 
you called it, a poetics of the digital age. And it was about literature, which really is an old tech in some ways, even if you read it on a Kindle. Do you, do you think that our conception of selfhood has altered significantly in this digital age, or are we still talking about the same problems? Um, I think I called it poetics because I hadn't done any sociological research. <laughs> I think poetics is a handy term for me. Um, I do think um, that, uh, that, we, that the conceptions of selfhood have, are being altered by these technologies. It really is a revolution, and it's a really exciting thing to think about the ways in which they are changing. And um, you mentioned William James earlier. I just want to um, uh, bring it back to his uh, brother Henry for a second. Henry James in A Portrait of a Lady, that very long novel, the, one of his sort of favorite scenes, even in his whole sort of oeuvre, was the scene of um, Isabel Archer sitting by the fire, the heroine Isabel Archer, and she was sort of mulling over her disastrous marriage. And it was a scene which was technically innovative in that it, had, it was a long chapter and it had no sort of external action. And it was all about um, the internal, the interior life. And what struck me was that the reason why he thought that it might be so, it was such an achievement for him, was that he, he felt he was capturing a human at, its, at their most human. Uh, and so I was interested in how these representations of personhood through literature over time could be mapped and to sort of try and find these different ways of representing the self in literature. And if we move to someone like, well, the modernists, the literary modernists um, in the early 20th century, they were really interested in the tension between the idea of an ultimately solitary self that couldn't be understood by anyone and, and the self as a communal project. I think really in modernism, the idea really gets going that who you are is, is really sort of some sort of amalgam or mosaic of the people around you. And it isn't, you don't have a sole copyright to your own personality. And they were playing with that on the page. I mean, it's really amazing to uh, take an extract um, from Marcel Proust's novel. And it's hard to imagine that he could imagine anything like Facebook when he wrote, um, even in the most insignificant details of our daily life, None of us can be said to constitute a material whole, which is identical for everyone, and need only be turned up like a page in an account book or the record of a will. Our social personality, he writes, is a creation of the thoughts of other people. And when I was reading that from my 21st century perspective, I was thinking, my, you know, that is sort of what Facebook is. It is sort of an account page um, in which you present yourself in this deceptively stable <coughs> manner. And us, we have to sort of think about where the self happens online. And really, social media is the main stage for this, as it happens now, how we manifest. And this idea that the social personality for Proust was a creation of the thoughts of other people. And yet, we now, um, with social media, have this strange oscillation between the two where we present this stable account page for other people uh, to comment on at any one time. Um, and within sort of these sort of modernist representations of self, if we go to another key modernist, Virginia Woolf, in her novel, a London novel, Mrs. Dalloway, on her, on her sort of morning stroll to go and buy flowers, she describes herself on the same page pretty much as being out, out, far out to sea and alone, but also part of people she had never met, being laid out like a mist between the people she knew best, who lifted her on their branches as she had seen the trees lift the mist, but it spread ever so far her life herself. So basically, in, in a single sort of page, we have this description of the self as a solitary atom out to sea, and this mist, a particular structure constructed by other people. So which one is it? And ultimately, I think for Wolf, um, she comes down to the conclusion that we're ultimately solitary. And she says at one point, uh, Clarissa Dalloway is looking over the road at her elderly neighbor moving around in the house opposite. And she talks about the supreme mystery of human solitude. She formulates this mystery as uh, what she calls the privacy of the soul. And there's this lovely line where she says, here was one room, there another. Did religion solve that or love? And I always think about Skype um, when, I, when I think about that uh, quote, here was one room, there another, because of course Skype attempts to sort of solve this by putting one room like the TARDIS inside another room. Um, so really that was sort of the literary background between, and I think that these are key questions that we still have to think about, this sense of are we solitary, are we communal, um, and what is the effect of the extreme connectedness um, of Skype, for example, but of all sort of social networking that is at once remote and intimate. 
And I think those are maybe my two sort of key terms, this remote intimacy is what really sort of interests me. And I would propose that our main difference in how the self is constructed in the digital age has been a sort of a considerable collapse of the public and the private. Um, and that we are being encouraged by the architecture of social media to construct an inside out self. And there's a really sort of simple example of that in the story I just told you about Mark Zuckerberg um, releasing the new reactions. He said that his users really wanted to express empathy. That was why they were given the hearts and this, and not to be trusted with the dislike button. Uh, we weren't quite nuanced with that yet uh, for that, but um, he wanted to express empathy, and I thought that was a really strange way of putting it, not to experience empathy, but to express it. Um, whereas, uh, you know, the original uh, term empathy comes from the German uh, Einfühlung, which is in-feeling, and everything seems to be more of an out-feeling in his, his construction of empathy. Um, another point to sort of bring up is the idea that social media creates, I guess, a kind of exposed intimacy, and we're not quite sure the scale of it is very deceptive. So one of my favorite uh, comedians is Sarah Silverman, and she was um, talking about, she wrote some what she called idle thoughts on Twitter about not having children, and uh, she was surprised at how much attention these tweets received. And people went up to her and said, why are you surprised you have 11 million followers on Twitter? 11 million. Um, and she says, I know, but somehow I just think of a tweet as like this message in a bottle that she's throwing out into the ocean. And that is sort of, I think, on a less extreme scale, because most of us don't have 11 million followers, that we do have this sort of deceptive sort of chamber orchestra feeling to our, uh, the expression of our lives. And yet it has this mercilessly international reach. And I think that needs to be talked about. Um, and really just the final point, um, I've been thinking a lot about in terms of this inside out self, I've been thinking about blushing a lot um, because blushing is this weird sort of uh, liminal um, sort of reaction that is sort of the inside feeling coming out and, the, and it sits, but it still sits intimately on the body, the blush. And Darwin was really interested in blushing and he couldn't really figure out uh, why we do it, why it gets, what triggers it. And he says that uh, blushing is probably the one uh, reaction we have that makes us the most sort of human. And there was a, a friend on that, on that subject, there was a French anatomist called Louis-Pierre Gra uh, Gratiolet. And he saw blushing as a sign of man's, man's high perfection since, and this is his quote, it is in the order of nature that the most intelligent social being should also be the most intelligible. And this is a 19th century view that since we're the most intelligent social being, we should be the most intelligible as well. And the blush was a, a, a betraying that sense that we can, other people can read us, our innermost sort of feelings at any one time. Um, and I think sort of going forward, we have to think of this idea of are we being, are we perfecting our status as the highest supreme uh, human beings uh, that there are on the planet? Are we asked all the time to be, become even more ideal, more perfect? because we're encouraged all the time to be more intelligible. Thank well, you. Thank, thank you. you. Um, uh, I wonder if um, Virginia Woolf's mist is um, what its relationship has to do with Google's cloud. Because mm -hmm. obviously that technology yeah. constantly appropriates the, the kind of innocence mm -hmm. of the language of I was thinking about how the term virtual, nobody ever talks about virtual reality. It's got a kind of a really yeah. 90s whiff about it, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, but uh, it seems to me on the kind of, it seems to me you're very ambivalent. So on that one hand, the two rooms are mm -hmm. put together mm -hmm. in Skype. And then on the other hand, there is a kind of emptying of inwardness and a kind of destitution of inwardness. Um, and I started to think that inwardness sometimes comes from reading, comes mm -hmm. from solitary acts, are you anxious that we're losing that kind of inwardness in our ardently, insistently externalizing online culture? Yeah, it's interiority. I mean, it's, it's such a question. I teach a lot of um, study abroad students and I've noticed in a way that uh, the generation above ours would probably be appalled at how few flowers we can name. Well, you know, like you walk by these, like, I have no idea what any flower is. And this speaks to my sort of, sort of urban experience. But a lot of the students, they don't really distinguish the word novel from other long form books. They just don't, it, that, that sort of nomenclature of text seems to be becoming more and more 
porous to them. So they'll refer to, I set this quite dry book called like The Rise of the Robots. It's very good, but it was definitely not a novel. It was sort of had, you know, full of sort of comparative incomes from the 70s onwards. And they would refer to it as a novel. Um, and I thought, what do you think a novel is? <laughs> uh, and, and they, but they I'm were- I'm laughing, but that's actually, the stakes are not quite serious. And especially if you want to write a novel, it seems a really bad, I <laughs> bad idea um, because they will hardly exist like peonies and uh, other flowers. But I mean, they, I think the novel is sort of a good indication of that because it's such a technology of interiority. And I mean, there's all, I, I'm really hesitant of these studies that says, you know, our attention spans are short and we can't uh, focus anymore because those sort of generalizations aren't necessarily helpful either. But I think there is, an, one can sense it in oneself and maybe others, that an internal thought, um, there is a temptation to publicize it online and then to sort of see how it responds and perhaps a thought that would have come and gone and I loved Sarah Silverman talking about the idle thought. She, she thinks of the, inter why do we think of social media as a repository for um, passing thoughts is what I, which is, is an interesting use that people have taken up and uh, are using it to express themselves. But what to me, and it, the biggest challenge with this is that we're learning all the time a grammar, not so much the grammar of, of sort of the Silicon Valley grammar, but what is the grammar of the sentences that we can write online, like as Legacy was talking about, that are not um, morally, don't have moral blind spots in some way, that uh, have this sort of idea that they're universal statements, but are actually very subjective expressions of one person's reality, but the form of them has this quite monumental vibe to them. And I think that's why there's so much ill feeling online is because the brevity and the aphoristic uh, format of the, of the platforms tend to create the sense that we're sort of um, producing edicts all the time when we're actually just voicing opinions. Yeah. Um, and it's that sort of the loss of, of interiority in the, for, uh, in the sense that other people take our maybe quite subjective opinions as these um, policies or edicts. Yeah, and there's a kind of um, relegation or a the demotion of pri privacy because mm -hmm. we live in an age of transparency and mm -hmm. freedom of information and WikiLeaks that we mm -hmm. apparently celebrate, but there is something to be said maybe for a kind of privacy and a non-disclosure too. And that comes from Zuckerberg, I think, really, because, and I think, when we're, you know, in 10 years, the platforms will have changed and they're already changing. My students think of Facebook as uh, not sort of an especially central thing. Um, but Zuckerberg's notion of privacy was always very odd, to say the least. So um, I think, but then we are sort of locked into sort of the architecture that he's been producing. Can I draw your two interlocutors in? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I would definitely agree with you, Lawrence, that this idea of kind of idle thought and how it becomes epic when you put mm -hmm. it online, yeah? And I, I feel like that um, while it has been the source of many problems, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at things like Gamergate, of course, right? You're seeing that it's like um, kind of a commentary and how it feeds back can actually create this furor that's quite toxic. Mm -hmm. um, and the virality of that, I think, can be really <sighs> challenging. Yeah. They're also, I think, within a kind of creative industry and a creative application of these technologies, a really exciting opportunity. Mm -hmm. Like, um, came to mind uh, is the, I don't know if anyone follows 21 Savage on Twitter. Um, he's a great rapper. Um, you should all follow him. Um, and I'm not being paid by 21 Savage, but um, <laughs> just to clarify, but I mean, like 21 Savage is, is a really good example of like a pop star that, um, you know, hip hop celebrity that has amazing interiority that comes out in drips and drabs and actually I find to be quite profound, right? And has kind of opened up thought in a philosophical sense for me. Or, you know, you're looking at artists like um, Anne Hirsch, for example, who currently is based in LA and she's got this like amazing kind of performative persona. Um, but if you meet her, she's actually, you know, quite a, a quiet and interior person. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so you would have maybe less of an understanding of that unless you see her on a stage. And so social media becomes that stage, yeah, right? Another yeah. person would be Hannah Black, who's an amazing oh. artist too. Yeah. Um, who actually has an exhibition up, I think, at Chisholm Hill right now. Um, but, you know, I think that there is this opportunity there for some of that interiority to be expanded even further. Mm -hmm. And when you mentioned Virginia Woolf, I found that to be a really, um, it's a really ripe uh, source to talk about something. Because, you know, in Woolf's time, of course, there was not social media, mm -hmm. there wasn't the internet. But if you take a figure like Woolf and think about what would have happened if she had been 
living right here, right now, I think she would have kind of been a weirdo at night on the internet. Yeah. Like myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, and I, I think that her Doing interiority... Shakespeare would have been tempting. Absolutely. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and um, that's another great uh, social media account, actually, the Shakespeare quotes. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, I think that she was someone who escaped or extended beyond her current condition um, mm. by writing. Yeah. That yeah. allowed her to have an exterior self that was yeah. quite profound. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we benefit from that, right? Yeah. Because we have these objects that we can hold on to, mm -hmm. that these books that we, you know, everyone keeps saying are going, you know, out yeah. of style, but yeah. you know, they're they're there. That we're you know, we're enjoying them, we're celebrating them, and and I do honestly feel that you know, someone today who might have some of that interiority that needs to, to be extended or, or kind of expanded on yeah. might turn to the internet. And that happens a lot for yeah. myself growing up and kind of being a digital native coming you know, of age at 12, 13. There was so much inside of myself as a queer woman, as, you know, or as a girl, um, you know, as a person of color, you know, and in female identifying, trying to understand how to extend your identity mm -hmm. and to take up space. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think using the internet, there's, there is something, there, the opportunity when you remove it from the cynicism that it's basically making us all super dumb and yeah, you know yeah. that basically it's ruining our brains yeah. um, I think that there actually is an opportunity there for many people and I would actually even go as far to go on a limb and say there are probably some of those people in this room um, who have felt that and, and been uh, able to benefit from that extension of self yeah I think yeah. we're going to hear a bit more about that in a moment mm -hmm. from you but David I want to give you a chance to come in if you sure I just wanted to pull out a couple of um, thoughts that I had as, as, as you were speaking really I mean, first really I was I was thinking in terms of this um, suggestion of this uh, a, a collapse of the distinction between public and private of course this is uh, not a new debate the debate around mass media in the 20th century yeah. so raise that question but I just wondered whether you thought there was something specific about um, public reason as as a form as something that's articulated and deployed and it, is there something special uh, that should be uh, defended in relation to the public use of reason as mm -hmm. opposed to this kind of publicity of uh, as it were, private reason. And secondly, I just wanted to um, ask the question. I mean, it's quite kind of interesting that um, in, in relation to this kind of like uh, 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 what you call an exposed intimacy, especially around the, the notion of, uh, of emotion and the uh, articulation of emotion, it seems to me that there's an, a, a kind of a, a reconfiguration of affective states and a new valuation, if you like, around what mm -hmm. kind of affective states are yeah. both deployed but also actually acceptable yes. in public life mm -hmm. yeah. and here I'm thinking particularly around anger and rage mm -hmm. so how rage is manifested through uh, certain kinds of social media mm -hmm. it, often in very unpleasant ways yeah. and, and what that says really about that changing sense of self and a changing sense of how emotions are deployed uh, in public yeah um, okay so I'll address the first yeah first question um just about public reasons Zadie smith said recently that she i mean she's not the future of social media usage for sure but she said one of the things that uh frightens her about going online is that she wants to have a feeling and have that feeling be wrong and not and she said i've, I've seen people have a feeling at 10 a.m and by 11 a.m have it drummed out of them by sort of online sort of uh, onslaught. discourse onslaught and i think that comes that addresses the public reason question that uh what is I think something that might be new is that there's sort of a more blurred distinction of when we express ourselves in, a, in an agora, a cyber agora, there's still, there's a, a disinhibited effect where it, it's more of a feeling more than a sort of something that you would want to be written into governmental policy somehow. I think there's an unmediated quality to the instantane, instantaneity of it, which means that we're not actually, we, if we went to a town hall meeting, we wouldn't sort of perhaps discuss in those ways. Um, and there's, that has to do with the tone. And I think some of the rage you're talking about comes when people realize that the I that they're talking about um, online, which is a very specific I, is actually being put to you, international peer review every time. So it's being undermined because you, like, they may say I so-and-so this, and then someone will say, well, it's not like that. It's not like that for me. It's not like that for me. And so therefore, this, the coherence of this I that many people hold very dear 
is sort of challenged a lot more than I think it would have been in the past by people, by strangers, by people they don't know. And that is maybe a source of the release of rage. Maybe I'll just That was it. a good answer, but not brief. You sound like one of those people who've got <laughs> 280 characters on Twitter. <laughs> um, Legacy, but thank you, really fascinating. Um, Legacy, you've already <laughs> indicated the enabling aspects of the digital age. Tell us, how do we harness the technology and to what purpose? I mean, just to expand on this idea of rage, I think that it's perhaps not um, advantageous for us to think of rage as a debilitating, uh, all negative experience. Um, I mean, if you look at like the campaign right now, I, if you call it campaign sort of Twitter storm, social media storm of Me Too, mm -hmm. right, which is coming on the back of all this that's been happening with he who shall not be named um, in, in Hollywood. But um, yeah, I mean, like that is an example of collective rage. Like these are people who are angry, who feel like they've been deserved, who feel like they've been assaulted quite literally. Um, and you know, existing in a world where there are so many examples, I think, of patriarchy as it as it stands, but especially, you know, looking at the US, um, you know, having someone who quite literally is a um, a predator in, the, in at the head of state, you know, like I think that that you know idea of me too, you know, how to channel anger, um, it can be productive too. It can be galvanizing. It can be you know a force that um, allows for uh, many many women and men alike, you know, across gender identifications to dress in pink and go march on the Capitol. I think that anger is something that um, we need right now, actually. Um, so to to say that. Um, you know, that we need to perhaps put, you know, to what end or to, to, how, to how to apply these things. I think it really is nuanced. I think it's a, a situation that has to be spliced and, and requires some, uh, you know, additional attention. Um, and, you know, the world that we're living in is one that continuously is being sliced and spliced. Um, you know, there's things are more and more niche in how we're looking at things. And that can be difficult when, as you were saying, Lawrence, there's a need perhaps for not the I, but there, for there to be a collectivity, yeah. to look beyond the self. Um, but I, I do feel like that, you know, when I am looking out at social media mm. and I'm seeing, um, you know, Me Too on my feed this morning at 5.30, um, you know, it, it makes me want to get out of bed because, and also it makes me actually challenge myself as, as an opportunity to be more honest, not only about my own individualized experience, because there are certain things within that that I suppress, right, or that yeah. perhaps I don't identify or, or wear on my sleeve, but to, to set a standard in my workplace, in my relationships, in the kind of interface online and otherwise, um, that, you know, is meaningful and, and makes for a, a sort of a secure existence um, where there is solidarity. So that, I think, is an example, perhaps, of where there is a long longevity of the online self where it actually encourages one to step away from the computer and to exist out in the streets. Okay, were you going to use your, yeah. your yeah, yeah. Lexi's gonna, she's going to actually <laughs> deploy some technology. <laughs> I am, I'm gonna try. So can everyone hear me? All right. Okay. <laughs> a little bit of light, please. Great. So 
there are many ways for us to kind of be thinking about the body, right? So this idea of the corporeal, which has been expounded on so much across history. So for the purpose of today, just for right now, I want all of us in this room to remain present with me. And for just a moment, regardless of what comes to mind when you consider this idea of body, um, to think about the body as an idea, um, an idea that is cosmic, and in being such is inconceivably vast, we quite literally have only begun to scratch the surface of what the body is, what it can do, and what its future looks like. So what does it mean to ghost on the body? Um, part of the definition of the archetype of the body as we know it, a social construct, a cultural tool, a political agent that I'm drawing on when I think about this idea of glitch feminism, is this notion of giving material form to something abstract. We use the body to give material form to something that has no form, that is abstract, that is indeed inconceivably vast. As a glitch feminist, I want to make abstract again that which has been forced into an uncomfortable and ill-defined material. The process of becoming material is one that is so bound up in problematics, it surfaces a lot of tension when we ask who has given material, and further, who defines this material, who names it, who gives it value, and why. So glitch feminism calls for this. It asks for us to take a look at the deeply flawed society we are all currently implicated by, participating within, to confront the violence this society has done to bodies who choose to disidentify, to bodies who exist within the liminal and embrace the in-between as core component of survival, of futurity, and to seek out opportunity to trigger errors within this flawed system. Glitch feminism embraces the causality of error and turns the gloomy implication of glitch on its ear by acknowledging that an error within a social system that has already been disturbed by economic, racial, social, sexual, and cultural stratification, as well as the imperialist wrecking ball of globalization, these processes that enact violence on all bodies, may not in fact be an error at all, but rather a much needed erratum. This glitch is actually a correction to the machine, and in turn, a positive social departure. Glitch is conjectured in finding its etymological roots in the Yiddish glitch, slippery area, or perhaps German glitchen, to slip, to slide. It is this slip and slide that makes the glitch plausible, a swim in the liminal, a transformation across selfdoms. <laughs> glitch calls for a breaking from the hegemony of a structured system with the pomp and circumstance of patriarchy, one that for all too long has had marginalized bodies and within this done so much violence to female identified bodies in particular, continuing to offend our sensibilities by only giving us a piece of the pie and assuming our satisfaction. As glitch feminists, we want to claim for ourselves permanent seats at the table, an empowered means of demarcating space that can be possessed by us in entirety, a veritable room of our own that, despite the strides made via feminist political action, has yet to truly belong to us. Except we don't want just a room, we want the world. <laughs> glitch feminism looks to the digital as a means of building these worlds. It underscores that the binary code of male-female and the code of real life as posited by the language of IRL in real life, pitted against the lives we lead online, which are somehow taken as less real, as being too rigid, not allowing for that slip and slide that is a reality of how gender and sexuality, how the cosmic bodies that they occupy exist today, have existed yesterday, and will continue to evolve, survive, and stay alive. The selves we occupy online at night, they're important, they're beautiful, and they're meaningful. So we have to continue to experiment and bloom and build within these selves. Artists play a really key role in this experimentation, acting as a bridge between what happens online and what happens AFK, away from keyboard, and strengthening the loop there. The internet is actually not a fantasy space, it is a future space, a space where glitch feminists can mobilize the imaginary as an activist tool to point toward a futurity that, though still buffering, is en route to being realized. Artists such as E. Jane, Manuel Arturo Abro, and Shawnee Mickelein Holloway are doing essential work here. <laughs> Uh, 
first and foremost, I'd like to welcome you to my garage. So these artists are actually creative architects. They're finding ways to stretch the idea of body to its limits, to make it cosmic, to return it to the immaterial, to celebrate its abstraction as a political tool. These artists create new constructs of the body online, and in doing so, they empower themselves, empower others, and ask of us to bring our own cosmic bodies offline out into the world at large. Though their respective practices can be quite different, we see within them the, plausibil the plausibility of quite literally becoming one's avatar. The selves we play at and perform as on Instagram, on Snapchat, on Twitter, they are actually blueprints for new bodies, cosmic in their capacity, vast in their virtuality, but also very real. Simone de Beauvoir is famous for positing that one is not born, but rather becomes a woman. The glitch posits one is not born, but rather becomes a body. The digital is actually a vessel through which our becoming realizes itself. So for us in this room, get glitched, become your avatar, and stay cosmic. and then turn you all to the real wolves. Um, this felt, you know, very innovatively. It felt almost bewilderingly innovative to me in a, in a great way. Thank you for it. Um, but it also made me think of false consciousness, right? That mm -hmm. it seems to be one of the... This is my very hurried, tweetable kind of precy of glitch feminism is that it's a kind... You're, you have this idea that there's a kind of pervert... The URL perversely alerts you to the false consciousness of RL, mm -hmm. that real life is a faulty, flawed, um, deficient, unjust thing. Um, but I, and I don't sense your project being at all 
nihilistic because it is so aesthetic, but I still want to ask you this question. Is it, can we, can we cache this cosmic body in the real world or does the real world not matter? I think it matters. I think I mean I, I don't think that the real world. I would ever say it doesn't matter. This idea of becoming your avatar, I think, is something that people within the context of like sort of techno feminism and fantasy space. Um, you know, Blade Runner is out in the theaters right now. This like extension of self as avatar that is still somehow fictional. I think we've arrived at a place where very safely we can say that that's not real. Right, people are making that bridge. They're they're making leaps in that direction, and and I think quite successfully, um, be it within a kind of contemporary art context or otherwise. Um, I particularly, because you know, I'm an art historian and someone who's invested in contemporary art on a you know emotional ideological level, um, as in, dis in addition to academic, I feel particularly that contemporary art extends it in a very awesome way, um, because artists basically are creating these case studies for how this can be pushed to its limit. But we see people who are kind of within the everyday doing this themselves and documenting themselves and kind of uh, making themselves visible. And so I think that sometimes within the context of social media or on these online platforms, um, this idea of the real self sometimes it's kind of placed given the backseat. It's, it's like the unsung hero. Um, people assume that what you're presenting online is somehow not real. Mm -hmm. And I think what I'm arguing is that it is real. That actually that there are people who are, you know, like my 13-year-old niece who basically has been, you know, absolutely amazing and incredible documenting herself. She's figuring out who she is, right? And I think there's within that a lot of value in taking that time to experiment and as well to see how one can gain the confidence to step beyond and to collectivize with people out in the world at large. Go Legacy's niece. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to shortchange you both sure. and open up to the floor. Um, let's see a show of hands. Uh, do we have a mic? We do have a roving mic. So maybe we could get uh, a, the, the row here and mm. the lady in the middle row. I'm going to take three at once, just trying to get as many of you as possible, and the lady in further along in the middle. So if you start at the front, work your way along, that would be brilliant. Thank you. Uh, I think my mind's a bit blown, but <laughs> legacy, legacy hashtag me too. Every <laughs> woman is saying that today. And so I'm going to try and keep it very simple. But when David talked about minorities and majorities, it took me a while to cotton on to what he was talking to. <laughs> because I would see myself as a minority or woman in terms of the fact that the BBC wants to, I consider it grooming, they want to know what I watch so they can give me more of the same. And I think the most obvious example, and why I won't do it, why I won't register, I will not watch the BBC, because I was watching female comics who were brilliant. And as a result, they kept sending up the likes of Stephen Fry, <laughs> um, Need I Go Further, the white male stale. <laughs> and so it's when you talk about the eight emotions or whatever, well, I'm sorry, I've got more than that, and I've got more, more selves than that, and I will not be groomed into one identity, whether it's an online identity or an outside, and I'm not on Twitter or Facebook, I'm sorry to say, because I'm kind of, I guess, hanging on to who I... I think that's a useful point, right? That just because that there is that spectrum that's being made available, that Mark Zuckerberg thinks he has us all figured out within those ranges of emotions, I, I do think that we are giving the public very little credit, right? And assuming that everybody is somehow dumbing down <laughs> rather than stepping up, that we're becoming more simple rather than more complex. And when I look at that range of emotions, I laugh because there are so many emotions within my day to day that actually I feel that I can't express via those different little icons. So I think it's great to be thinking about how you can um, extend beyond that, but also <coughs> the fact that just because it's there doesn't mean that that's becoming who we are. Just because there are lots of questions, I'm going to get the other two questions in and then invite you all to respond to whoever you want to as well. So there was a question behind there and then further along the row in front. Perfect, thank you. Hi, uh, I think the composition of the panel kind of indicates the profitability of interdisciplinarity when it comes to a topic like the self. And because of that, I was just wondering how do the panelists, artists, um, literary studies, people, uh, digital humanities, don't know what that is, sorry. Um, <laughs> how, how do you as okay. assess the contributions of um, psychological and like heart scientific literature on the self because a lot of the things that you're talking about strikes me of, uh, as things that other people are interested in. For example, I think um, someone raised a literary modernist stream of consciousness. Uh, that seems relevant um, in like developmental psychology and study of um, perceptual processes, MRI scans and all that. And then there was another thing mentioned about the exteriority of um, personhood and I think that's a concept that was raised up in the 70s by um, 
I believe his name was Erwin Goffman, about the like social construction of the self, right? Um, so that was the first question, and I'm going out on a limb here a little to so ask... Very brief second question. It's a subset of it, it's not a separate one. Um, so uh, can you make it brief? Make it a tweet. Okay, are marketers really that evil? Because there's a lot of slagging off of like Mark Zuckerberg and everything, but I was at the... Marketers evil, fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> because they claim that the seven reactions were culled from empirical data. Thank you. Um, event. So let's squeeze that other question in. Are marketers evil? And then one question here. Um, my question is to Legacy. You talked about the internet and social media as being an incredible place to express oneself and your 13-year-old niece being able to get to know herself and in such a way um, and a place to galvanize online. Is there, is it problematic, do you think, if there's a separation between who someone believes themselves to be offline and what they project online? I think it's a great question. And um, may I answer? Of course. Thank you for answering questions. <laughs> um, I think it's a great question. I don't think that I have resolved that as, as um, you know, an individual existing in the world. I feel like that my initial reaction is no. Um, that gap is totally appropriate in, in many circumstances where someone you know, is existing in their day to day and may have a <laughs> private self that exists somewhat publicly but also online. There's where these things kind of intersect. Um, but I do honestly feel that because of my own experience, and I can only speak from myself and you know, kind of the community that I operate in, that the digital has done so much to kind of strengthen a loop that it is something that's worth paying attention to, um, where those things intersect rather than considering it as being kind of alone at night on the internet. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, I think you know, Sherry Turkle was like the person who became really famous saying that like the internet makes us miserable and alone and you know, it was, but you know, in the early iteration of that scholarship, she was writing actually quite the opposite mm -hmm. about how it was something that was bringing people together. So I think within the scope of the internet and its history, right, um, setting aside the fact that it was you know, largely created by the military, but you know, <laughs> when you're kind of looking forward, um, the, there are moments where that ebb and flow happens, where within scholarship, within popular opinion, people see that things are kind of coming together and kissing, right, like that, those different selves, and where people might argue to the contrary. Um, and I don't actually think that there's one set uh, sort of correct ethos or approach. I think it comes down to the individual, which is important. And it's, I think it's important to maintain that, too, that the individual has autonomy um, within this conversation. Thank you. So, uh, David, um, yeah. do you want to go? Are marketers evil? You are wearing an Apple Watch. Um, so, well, <laughs> Apple, Apple aren't a marketer as such. I mean, they're a, um, actually interesting in this whole discussion because their political economy is based around making things. Uh, and that's kind of different to the Googles and the Facebooks and so on and so forth, who are more interested in, in a kind of construction of a, 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 um, a, a, a space to sell, sell things in particular, and, and very aggressively as well. So are marketers evil? Well, I'm not sure about the kind of category um, that's used, good and evil. I, I think that's kind of problematic. Uh, of course, there are norms and there should be norms around these kinds of behaviours. And I think this comes back to the first question about how one defends one's identity <laughs> And one's privacy, I suppose, in some sense, but with cautionary uh, uh, quotation marks, but certainly the sense of self. How does one defend it? And I think we can even um, we can even uh, widen that and ask how does society defend itself? Right? I mean, I I do think that there are aspects to our society, certain institutions, that need to be defended. I think that um, we are in a situation whereby we have to ask the question how much digital technology is too much digital technology, uh, what are the implications of this, uh, in a sense, runaway uh, mm -hmm. world of digital technology. And I think this, this raises uh, interesting questions about what is to be done. And that kind of ran through the panel, I think, in really interesting ways. And we, we need to think about, well, uh, how far can a, a voluntarism deal with these, these problems? How, how much can we individually uh, cope and to what extent do we have to have to a wider collective notion of response to this? And I, I think this really raises the question, actually, again, for the state. You know, what can the state do to defend our institutions, defend our notions of autonomy, defend our space of learning, uh, particularly in, in notions of um, what I was calling minority, but in terms of childhood, in terms of growth, and in terms of those that are essentially um, targeted by these technologies. I mean, we're all targeted 
but some people are targeted much more aggressively than others. Here I'm thinking of people with um, a lower education, the poor, and so on and so forth, right? What, what do we do about these kinds of really important social uh, uh, questions? So I, I don't think it's a question of good and evil, because I think that casts it in a, an odd way. Um, I think the one thing about the marketers is that the uh, Silicon Valley writer was saying that the biggest prize right now in uh, the new sort of technology coming out is how to recognize us in multiple, across multiple different apps. So how does uh, the consumer, uh, the marketers know that when you use your mobile, you're the same person as when you're on Facebook, as when you're on your laptop? And to try and amalgamate and to match that up to a physical address in material space. So this sort of what excites me about glitch feminism that it seems to be sort of wanting to um, sort of short circuit this idea for coherence, which is a marketer's dream, that we will be predictable if we like this female comedian will like a, a metaphorical other female comedian. And, and it's a series of similes of, uh, as an approximation of the self. And I think that slip slide is really exciting when we think that actually it behooves marketers, not anyone else, for us to be highly um, coherent and stable across all our platforms. Let's get three more questions. One at the front here, and then let's scoot to the back. There are two at the back. How much philosophical ground are you willing to concede to biology and the very clear nature of a binary reality that we can't escape? I mean, male, female, you can glitch as much as you want to the binary, but it's there, it's, it's nature. How much are you willing to concede that? Let's get the other two questions in first. Don't feel obliged. That seems like a big question. Don't feel no, obliged it's a, it's a question. Okay. Let's get the two more in. Uh, mine's a smaller question than that. Um, <laughs> going back to what you were saying at the beginning of the talk about um, you're kind of contrasting these two dimensional simplified uh, selves in a way that we have online with the um, um, stream like technologies, you said, compared to. Um, compared to maybe earlier reflections of ourselves or that people put forward in literature or art, for example. But do you think maybe actually streamlike technologies could be argued to be a more, um, could actually be more accurate in a way? Because they show our every thought. They show um, the thoughts we get wrong, the things we get right. They're messy. Mm -hmm. that, so, that, yeah, that's kind of my question. Okay. Question next to you. Um, this is a quick question. Not to question the, the reality or materiality of uh, our online beings or s digital selves. How do you translate um, the, the, the digital actions such as tweeting, liking a post, uh, reacting to a post into actual actions? So. so one about binary reality, one about streamlined selfhood, and one about reality and meta-reality. Any takers? <laughs> me, me, me. <laughs> um, so, uh, just a few thoughts. So, addressing you, gentlemen, um, I, I actually disagree. And so, this is where perhaps it might be useful to consider what sources and texts that you can draw on if you want to know more about this kind of um, theory, but also just, uh, I guess, um, the history that, that is kind of leads up to this. So I, I'm happy to chat with you more if you'd like to know some different books that you know would be really helpful. But um, initially, I would say like looking at Audre Lorde, looking at Sadie Plant, looking at Donna Haraway. Um, these are people who have done a lot of work. Looking at Octavia Butler, um, who've done a lot of work within the realm of theory, but also, of course, grounding that quite firmly within this discussion of biology as it relates to gender. Um, and I, I do think that the binary is something that needs to be challenged. I, I think we're living in a world right now where it's challenging for many to, to process how diverse the spectrum is becoming. Um, but it's very important that we're continuing to put that forward and to ask ourselves to imagine more. Um, but thinking very quickly about this idea of, of liking and how you, you know, manifest online action or ritual offline, I love that question because um, you know, it brings to mind this idea of slacktivism where you're like mm. in bed with your Doritos and eating pizza and you're like loving Saturday night and you decide to like go on Facebook and like everybody's at the march, whatever the march might be because there have been many marches over this past <laughs> year, right? And you just are liking everything and feeling real good because you've like put all your stuff into this box. 
Um, and then you turn your computer off and then you, you know, chat with a friend on the phone and you're just like, everyone looks sick at the march, right? But then you go to bed. Um, <laughs> that is a real thing. And actually, so that is where the loop fails. And, and like my, you know, discussion of this importance of the loop, this is why I think it's important to be focusing on strengthening the loop between away from keyboard and what's happening online. Because it is not enough for us to only be acting and acting in activism via the digital. It needs to manifest itself elsewhere. And I think the digital has been, especially for people of color, women, female identifying people, people who are other in any capacity, or people actually who, you know, to be quite frank, are maybe more reticent or shyer to exist within the, the world as an initial plunge, right? These spaces have been incredibly important. They've been educational tools. They've been opportunities to build community. Um, they've been opportunities to be super weird in a way that actually, you know, in a real space, quote unquote, as in, you know, if you're stepping out and just doing that with no previous practice, if you will, can feel really scary. Um, so that congregating and that community building, that like wandering, um, you know, if we're bringing it back to Benjamin, Benjamin wrote a lot about this idea of botanizing the asphalt, right, where you're able to wander. Wandering is a privilege. Um, and so being able to wander online in specific is something that we work towards, but I think as well needs to loop back where we wander offline too. Lawrence, that question back seemed directed at you. Yeah, I love that question because because my sort of uh, academic background is in sort of literary modernism. And um, it, the more I was studying digital life, it did seem that there were tons of formal sort of similarities as sort of the idea of this fracturing of um, uh, representation online when, when you can do that. And also, I guess, I mean, the modern, one of the modernist main projects was to say that, it, you know, the personal is the political in their own way. They were saying that, that we have to have politi uh, personal honesty in order to have um, an honest public sphere. And I think, th though the difference might be is that there, the sort of the representations of the self on the page was still a, a, a sense of the interior. It was a representation of the interior. And all that we've done in a way is externalized that modernism. And maybe they would have been all for that project. They wanted honesty. They didn't believe maybe in especially um, keeping secrets, that they believe that your thoughts should be projected outwards. Um, so I think it's really true. I think all, uh, many of the forms of modernism are really instructive to today. Yeah, I'd just like to pick up that point as well. I mean, in a certain sense, I think that's a question about authenticity and the authentic mm. self. Uh, one thing I would, I would caution is I think you have to historicize authenticity. Uh, it's not like we are we have a, 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 a almost scientific notion of the self such that one uh, continually mm. gets closer and closer to its actual real definition as it were I think that would be very problematic so that's the first thing so you know we, we can historicize the notion of self and we can historicize the notion of authenticity but one thing I would um, ask you to bear in mind really is that this this authentic self of today living in the stream living in this uh, this digital moment is we is strangely coincidental with the one that makes sense uh, with the political economy of Silicon mm -hmm, Valley, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. With their ideologies of what they want the self to be in order to, to valorize uh, that self. And I think that should make us cautious, mm -hmm. right? About the, the way in which people articulate uh, a certain, um, uh, 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 a certain uh, desire to dissolve oneself in the networks, right? Mm -hmm. What's going on there? You know, we should be very critical about that. I just want to also very quickly pick up this question about um, uh, somehow that um, uh, performance or practice in the digital has, uh, has a disconnect with the real world. I think what we're starting to see that that's certainly no longer the case, if it ever were the case. Uh, for example, um, the way in which you know, code, computer code, functions to be operative in the world in a, in a very performative sense, mm -hmm. and the way in which you know, we're seeing it again and again and again, things that happen in the digital have massive effects in the real world. And of course, the Trump election is a very good example of that. Uh, Cambridge Analytica using these digital fragments, these traces of our lives, in order to, 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 to change an electoral result. Same with Brexit, these Cambridge Analytica was used there. And also the way in which um, uh, hacking and, and viruses and all that are part of our much more part of our everyday life, right? So, uh, for example, uh, the NSA, the US government and the Israel, Israeli government um, literally hacked um, uh, the Iran nuclear processing facilities um, by just injecting code across the internet, right? We're living in a very strange time when this kind of cyber warfare, as it's as it called, 
actually means, you know, stuff online, as it were. Online is an anachronism, of course. But stuff happening in the digital really does have an effect in the everyday world. Let's get three more to round up. Um, one at the back. So let's get the person there with the arm raised right next to you. And then the one at the back and the one here at the front. Thank you. Um, so I work in advertising, um, and to the earlier question whether all marketers are evil, they <laughs> definitely are. Um, <laughs> so one thing we kind of talk about, because we've seen kind of marketing products, we like, well, what do people want? And yeah. kind of, you know, um, what what's going to be able to make us sell to them? Um, and there's this kind of concept where in sort of the modern age, because of the access to knowledge and the ease of communication, everyone's becoming very individual, and anyone can be who they want to be. So everyone's a journalist, everyone's an artist, everyone's an entrepreneur. Um, so there's that. But there's on the flip side, because of that ease of connection, people are actually kind of becoming incredibly needy. So this whole idea of, you know, I'm putting myself out there and I'm this individual person, but I have this desperate need to be accepted and to fit in. And if I don't get the number of likes I think I should, then I'm going to be crushed uh, by it. So I guess, is that something that you see um, that's come because of the digital age, or is that something that we've always had just as part of the self, this kind of like conflicting identities? Um, and I guess what would be your advice to the world who is kind of experiencing this internal um, antagonism? How would you kind of console them to, um, to solve it? Thank you. So that was about neediness. The question <laughs> right at the back, I'm really making you work, I'm sorry. Yes, uh, third party ownership of that digital self and the ability for third parties to shut off your Twitter account. That nice and concise, my favourite kind of question. <laughs> and the one at the front. Um, with the way technology is embedded in our lives and the amount we invest in technology, um, is it right to look at ourselves as social self and real self? Or should we now look at people as human techno entities? Or shall we wait till 2049? <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Uh, answers. <laughs> Neediness, third party ownership, and human techno entities. I'll say something about neediness, <laughs> especially, especially the subject. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, it's, it feels a safe, intimate space. Um, okay, I just think what uh, what's, I loved your question, and I think there's been a maybe there'll be a bit of a red herring possibly in in that whole sort of tedious idea of the selfie generation and the narcissistic generation that is like um or this sort of idea of self-absorption i think if we're going to take sort of freud's nomenclature which we don't have to i think going forward i think it may be the superego that is actually more prominent and that i think speaks to the idea of the neediness that sense that um things that we put forward automatically we project this audience for them in advance which is in a sense a form of a, 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 a superego relationship to the world how is the public going to um, accept this. Um, and I think a lot of this has to be um, coded into the architecture of the platforms that we're willing to adopt. And I think we're seeing this in many ways, like um, The Guardian in a lot of cases. Uh, p journalists at The Guardian were arguing that any other employer would have a duty of care to the mental health of their employers by not having the below the line access where you can just get trounced and assassinated day in, day out. And I think that's part of the architecture of the web page that they've removed that a lot of the times, not on comment is free so much. But I think that that's, that'll be one way to reduce the neediness by not allowing everything to be quantified in that way. Like, why do we need to be able to quantify people's reactions to a photograph? That's part of, that has other, another commercial agenda ultimately. And I think uh, part of the political activism will be refusing these sort of sadistic architectures that aren't really doing any of us much favor. Yeah, I'd like to pick up the same point, I think. Um, I think um, this diagnosis of, of sociality and, and um, the individual, the kind of uh, contradictions between the two, I mean, this is, uh, of course, not a new phenomenon, right? So sociologists, certainly at the turn of the 20th century, were interested in uh, this sense of, of uh, a fragmentary self, of problematic self, of essentially being lonely in a crowd, as it were, as diagnosed through a condition of industrial capitalism, right? Mm -hmm. So we, there is a tradition there which, of course, we have to uh, look back at and, and, and try to think through uh, and, and try to understand whether there is a, an, intense, an intensification that's taking place through what we might call digital capitalism. Mm -hmm. Is there something different? Is there something 
more frightening? Is it, is it more of a problem? And if so, you know, what are uh, our responses to it? Right? What, what do we want to be in our societies and what do we want our societies to be? Um, the other point uh, about a new kind of entity, I think, kind of connects that in a really interesting way. <coughs> You know, I mean, asking about whether we are um, somehow different because of our technologies, I think, uh, is a really good question. Uh, again, it's a, a question that um, we see again and again, both in philosophy but in other fields too. Um, you know, did writing transform us as an entity? Right? This, mm -hmm. uh, Plato famously thought it did in a bad way, actually. Uh, and other writers throughout history have, have uh, posited that new technologies have been destructive of, of our sense of identity and our sense of self. So I think that's a good question to ask. I don't think there's a, a, a simple answer to that, but uh, uh, thanks for that. Dixie? I mean, in terms of the neediness question, I, I do sense that um, I don't think it's new. Like, I, I guess, you know, the technology is new and how it's manifesting itself is new. The anxiety might be new, right? How it's heightening, you know, in what capacity. I definitely feel like after a lot of the, the things that have happened with various elections, I spent less time on Facebook, you know, like immediately stepped away from that as a platform because of how it was being curated, in what capacity people were putting information in, taking it out, how it had impacted this space that we all exist within. Um, but I think the neediness is something that's a human part of our existence, right? And so um, the idea, like you were saying, which is quite a, a lame idea of like this narcissistic mm -hmm. person who is self-obsessed and self-absorbed and it's like all about selfies and that's all that matters, yeah. I think is like a real disservice to what it can be and what it often is for many people. Um, and, you know, in terms of the, the idea of like tracking your likes or needing to kind of like cross check to make sure that everyone loves you. Um, I mean, there's like the, the kind of black mirror parody of it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is like super extreme or you read these stories which I collect them online, which is quite sick, actually. But, you know, where you're like, oh, you know, someone was uh, hiked to the top of Kilimanjaro and they lean back just too far with their selfie stick and they fall off. Mm. You know, like, I think that there are these stories that are, like, kind of epic that encapsulate that social and cultural collective consciousness, that deep anxiety, but that that actually is... Um, salacious in many ways and it's it's part of the the narrative of this technology that works against its better self yeah we didn't answer the third party ownership uh -huh. question but come and talk to us at the end yeah um can i thank you for being such an engaged audience and being here with us i want to thank the audience elsewhere in the ether who've been following us. I need to apologize to them too, because would you believe it? We had some technical glitches <laughs> with our stream, but I would like to say that there are angels in our errors. Um, you can download and listen to our podcasts on YouTube, on iTunes, and our blog as well, um, the forum. Uh, can I ask you to join me lastly in thanking our magnificent speakers?